Hey there, welcome, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening whenever you're watching this. It's Coach Pipes coming at you as always, live, excited, and full of energy. Welcome back to our Agent Accelerator podcast where we're bringing you the best people, scaling up, breaking that seven figures, going well beyond. And today we've got such a privilege. I got to, I get to bring on like a really good friend of mine that we we're talking, we know each other. Jeez, man, seven, 14, 14 years? It's been a while, man. It's 13 been a, years, it's been a almost while. a, a yeah. decade, right? Um, you know, neighbor of mine up here in uh, Salt Lake Valley, Mr. Rod Moser. So Rod, pleasure to have you on, man. I can't wait for people to get a chance to actually get to know you uh, and just what and learn from the evolution that you've been through. So uh, thanks, man. Grateful to be here. Yeah. So let's just start with some basic questions so that everyone just gets to know right at the very beginning. How long in real estate? I uh, got in in 2007, so about 14 years. About 14 years. Um, you've done multiple roles inside uh, real estate. You've been, why don't you tell, like, you've been like an agent, team lead, like across the board, right? Yeah, isn't that Mortgage. terrible? Sometimes I get bored, right? So yeah, so started out as a solo agent, grew into a little bit of a team, uh, was, uh, became a, you know, a team leader with Keller Williams. Then I managed the uh, Century 21 office here in, in Salt Lake. And I, I became a coach with, Tom Ferry and now John Shep Black have kind of played a few roles, put a few hats on. You have, and prior to that, you were a mortgage over in Oklahoma, right? I mean, yeah, so did that as well. Yeah, like for for about four or five years. So you've you've worn multiple hats, and so I think there's a lot that individuals are going to be able to actually get to learn from you because you've been the agent, you've grown the team, you've been the team lead, you've grown a brokerage, right? You've coached a boatload, right? And now you have you and uh, your lovely wife actually have your own team rich. You have your own brokerage of 10 individuals right now as well too in the greater Salt Lake Valley, correct? Yeah, I've screwed up a lot of stuff. I've uh, failed a ton. So hopefully people can learn from that and not have to go through those same mistakes. So let's, let's start real estate. Let's start in the real estate piece because a lot of people who are watching this are still in production. We'll go to leadership for all of our great leaders that are watching as well too and, and hear about what you've done there. Um, the marketplace that you worked in, tell us about Logan, right? So how big is Logan? Yeah, so Logan's a pretty small community. Um, you know, as far as real estate markets go, there were around 600 or so houses sold in a year. Um, just like most markets, there were around seven or 800 agents that were playing the game. Um, I was new to Logan when I got into real estate. I, I had lived in Oklahoma City, uh, ran a mortgage company for a while, and then moved back where my family is kind of from and uh, stepped into Logan without uh, a sphere. I didn't know anybody. I just picked a community because I loved it. It's a beautiful place to live. Because so. it's huge. It's a big bustling metropolis as well too, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> lots yeah. of mountains, lots of cows. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. I've actually gone to a soccer tournament up there for Liam, right? For my son. And it's a, it's a hike, but once you get up there, yeah. it's like God's country. So yeah, it's gorgeous. 400, 500, 600 sales taking place in Logan back in 2006, 2007 for the entire marketplace. Um, how many were you guys uh, like, and you had a, at that, like at that time you had a large team, small team, like what, what was it? It was just me, man. Um, I hadn't met my partner that I partnered up with in real estate at that point. So when I got there, I knew nobody. I had no sphere of influence. I had just changed, um, you know, project uh, di uh, directions. I went from mortgages to real estate and, uh, and just started there. Uh, luckily, I found a great mentor. And within three years, I was selling around 100 homes a year. So there's 500 homes, 600 sales, 500, 600 sales that are taking place per year. And you and your partner at the time, your business partner at the time, and an assistant, right? And that's the three of you guys. We're doing 100 plus transactions, 20 to 25% of the overall market share. That's insane, right? Um, people would want to know, like, how did you do it? So what were you doing, like a lot of marketing or what was your strategy? What was your ML strategy when you guys were doing this? And how yeah, did you get there, didn't, man? Didn't have a lot of money. So um, I, you know, in fact, uh, Melody introduced me to you way back then. And we had some um, conversations. So what I decided to do, as silly as it sounds, is I would take 30 plastic beads, like the little beads that go on a necklace, and I would put them in my right pocket when I started the day. And throughout the day, I would have 
conversations around real estate. And every time I had a conversation around real estate, I would remove one of those beads from my right pocket. I'd put it in my left pocket and I wouldn't quit a day until I had 30 conversations around real estate with people in the community. So that could be that like, just, it, man. That, that could be like, like I'm, at, I'm pumping gas. I'm talking to the person that's across from me. I'm going to the restaurant. So were you like just all, all ABP, always be prospecting, right? That was so. it, right? I mean, when you first start to do that, it's amazing um, how difficult it is to actually have 25 to 30 conversations around real estate in a day. So sometimes I would find myself 6.30 at night at the grocery store, I still had five beads to go. And the poor person in front of me uh, in line at the grocery store with the kids, hey, uh, my name is Rod, I don't recognize you. Do you live around here, right? It was, uh, and do you own or do you rent, right? Like that was the conversation. Same thing at the gas stations. Every once in a while, you know, you're in a college town, you end up at the grocery store at 11 o'clock at night with two more beads left. And you're going to go out and you're going to have those conversations because I wasn't going to quit, right? So that was that was really what drove it. That is the difference between Chep and I, but John and I have been talking about this between a commitment and a goal. A commitment is it's going to happen regardless, right? There's no variance to it whatsoever. And a goal is just a good idea for a lot of people. So, so you had this, this bead game that you were playing, were you also doing like, which is like, I call that social prospecting, which you're just trying to talk yeah. to as many people as you possibly can. Did that include like you picking up phone call, uh, picking up calls and making that like, that would be a move bead left pocket to right pocket. Every morning, right? So every morning I would start with, you know, as many people as I knew, I was trying to stay in touch with them. That, that was small at the beginning and it grew over time, but I was hitting expireds. I was hitting for sell by owners. And it was interesting because we had a pretty heavy amount of for sale by owners in the community. And at first I thought, wow, that's really weird. But I got energy behind it because I said, why wouldn't they hire somebody? It's a small community. Everybody knows everybody. Why wouldn't they hire somebody? And my belief was they must have had a bad experience. So if that's the case, this is an opportunity that provides me an area where I can grow. And I just really bore down on for sale by owners and how to learn, you know, it's motivation followed by emotion followed by action and how to really drive that forward. And my belief was they, they didn't know anybody that they trusted enough to hire. So there was a void in the, in the environment. And that's where I focused. And I could usually get, you know, 14, 15 conversations through those prospecting numbers before I had to rely on knocking doors or, you know, gas stations or gas that. station. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Hi, can I pump your gas for you? Sure. Hey, by the way, do you own a rent? <laughs> right? yeah. so, that's awesome, man. Um, now it's sort of, sort of interesting to me because you, you know, knowing you, um, and just background in history. I mean, you didn't grow up with the silver proverbial silver spoon in your mouth. I mean, you, you know, like what was this a learned trait of work hard? Um, or like, like, give me a little background on who Rod is, you know, above and beyond, you know, just this guy who sold a hundred homes owned 20 to 25% of the market share of Logan. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about it, about the next sure, steps man. for him. So it was interesting because, um, I'm, I'm a very shy, quiet, person, right? Um, I'm very introverted. And I think I got that because I was so ashamed growing up. We grew up in a, in a trailer home. Uh, my dad was a school teacher. My mom didn't work. There were five of us kids. We didn't have a lot of money. Christmas was, you know, um, hand-me-downs and refurbished different things from other family members. Oftentimes we were broke and it was difficult. And I got into sports because it allowed me to thrive where money didn't really matter. And I just started to, you know, I remember getting up at 4.30 in the morning, going into school with my dad, who was the principal at the time, and uh, just getting on a batting machine and just, you know, pounding balls and just getting better. Um, I'd set it up to bounce balls off the floor, became a catcher, and I'm diminutive. You know me, I'm not very big, but I just, it was an area that I could excel in. And so I started to drive and drive and drive and drive and drive. And I realized that, the more successful I got at different skill sets, the more I got recognized and I started to come out of my shell. And that was really, I think, the beginning for me where um, I had, you know, it was a survival uh, yeah. trait to kind of push beyond my boundaries a little bit. So you start, you got the taste. I mean, so that repetition of putting the additional time in that you saw in sports, right? And you play in high school, played in high school. Yep. 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 Played play beyond school, that. Played in or... college at Eastern Utah. Yeah. Oh, really? I didn't know yep. that, dude. That's amazing. Yeah. Catcher the entire time. Catcher. Yeah, it was. Uh, and, you know, it took a, it took a, I had to get up at 430 in the morning to compete with all these athletic guys. So yeah. anyways, 
Yeah. yeah. So the, it's interesting. I always say the same things you see in athletics in terms of repetition is what you see with successful agents and their teams in business. That repetition is the mother of skill. So you're like a living embodiment. That makes sense why it is that you are so skilled is because you take the same approach. So um, you guys, like all of a sudden the recession hits, the great recession hits and, and, you know, like for a listing agent, which you guys primarily were, right? Um, that's a, that's a tough game in 2008, 2009, 2010. So take us through like the transition of how you moved into becoming and growing one of the most successful, uh, you know, offices in Utah or in, in Keller Williams and here in Utah. Sure. So it was interesting because yeah, when the market started to shift and, and a mistake that I made over and over and over again, didn't even realize it was a mistake is I would go out on these listing appointments and I would talk about, you know, I developed the questions. I sucked at this at first. So I would talk about how great I was. Look, I sold this house. I sold that house. And I ended up getting some business, but that's where the problems came in. I was carrying like 55, 60 listings at a time, and you'd maybe sell five a month. And, you know, six a month, seven a month. It was very, very frustrating for a lot of the sellers. And I remember specifically one, <clears throat> one morning, I woke up and I had five voicemails that I'd gotten the night before and that morning early. And they were sellers and it was everything from tears to anger and frustration. Why isn't my house selling? You told me my house was worth this much money and you know, it appraised for this much when we put it on the market. Now you're asking me to reduce the price of another $15,000 or whatever it was. And at about that same time, and I didn't know, I didn't know how to fix it. And I had a, a guy call me and he goes, Rod, have you ever thought about selling anything besides real estate? Well, he couldn't have caught me at a better time. And he offered me an opportunity to go to Hawaii and sell solar panels. And I was like, you know what? I might. Um, three weeks later, I literally signed over every listing I had to my partner. I jumped on a plane and I went to Hawaii and chased sharks and hung out on the beach and sold solar panels once in a while till I ran out of money. And at that point, uh, a friend of ours, Boyd Brown, reached out to me. And, Great guy. Uh, he amazing said, man, Boyd. Amazing Big shout guy. out to Boyd, right? Love you, man. So He said, uh, hey, I'm looking for somebody to, to help me manage my office, my KW office here in Salt Lake. Would you be interested? So I went over and we talked and he ended up giving me a great opportunity. And it was Did a you have point. any any leadership experience except for your small team like like the, I, I never realized like I always thought like you I, I knew a little background but I always thought like you like kick-ass leader kick-ass TL etc so did you have any leadership experience leading up to that no man and I failed a lot like that's part of the process I think is uh, being okay with that but what what really happened is I dove in just like I did in the early baseball days just like I did when I started real estate I read every book I could possibly get my hands on on how to how to produce profit. You know, what is the difference between revenue and profit and what are the key indicators that move all of those? And when I got that, I also got some amazing training with some of the best, you know, best people in the industry from, you know, the Kokoskas to Gary Keller and was able to get inside their inner circle and start to learn, understand what a trend report was, how to read it and what levers to push. What I really discovered when, when we jumped into the office, there were less than 100 agents in this office, and we grew it to 200. And what was amazing was what happened to the profitability. I learned really quickly that it's not so much about moving the agents from 10 transactions a year to 30 transactions a year. There's a few that you can have a little bit of an impact on, but the real driving measure behind profitability of an organization is agent count. It's it's attracting the right individuals. It's really driving that. We we doubled the size of the office, um, broke records. It was the first time that office had been profitable for 12 months in a row. We were giving out profit share. It was an amazing experience. And then I and then I got the opportunity after that to uh, to manage the, the largest Century 21 office in the country. Uh, we had around 800 agents and um, and that's where I stepped into that shortly after the Keller Williams experience. So. Who's, whose office was that? The C That was George Morris's That's office. what I thought. I'm like, yeah. I did not know that you, man, that you worked with the George and John yeah. and Rob and that entire crew, man. So. Yeah, it yeah. was, uh, it was, a, it was an interesting experience. Um, and it was, you know, it was, I was only there for a little over a year before I got opportunities to, you know, start working with you and with Tom directly and, and continue to grow my team. And that's where I transitioned into the, into the coaching aspect, which has been, 
a tremendous, yeah. you know, a tremendous opportunity. And, well. and oh, what a great coach you have made. Like, and the, like the same approach that you've taken to baseball, to your real estate business, to leadership, right? You've put into coaching and it shows, you know, one of the most requested coaches that we have right now. Um, so let's go back to this. I, I got two questions for you, right? Because I, sure. you know, one of the promises that I want is that every single person walks out of here have, with clarity on their path to be able to get to a million dollars if they're, if they're lower than a million dollars or with clarity on how can I be a better leader, right? So let's go, let's go leadership first because we just got done talking about what the results you produce. So let's, let me clarify this for everyone. 96 to 190 agents, right? In the course of a couple of years, okay? Went from non-profitable to now profit and one of the most profitable organizations in all of Utah. Uh, uh, and, you know, on the, on the shoulders of the work that you and your team did. Sure. What would you say are the three things that you would want to tell every single leader that you have learned from your work um, over the course of the last uh, decade uh, in, in a brokerage or a team rich, which you and Melody, your partner and wife now run together. So sure. Um, I think the most important thing to start with is you have to catch the vision. You have to know where you're going and be clear about it. And the reason for that is you have to become the person that everybody else wants to work with. You have to, to show up and be the leader that you would want to work with that is going to help drive your business forward. And you've got to have enough of a vision to be able to, to clearly communicate that with the people that are going to jump on board. You're going to change their lives. They're going to become people that they never even dreamed of um, as they continue to grow with you. Who do you have to be to attract that type of an agent? And I think when you're really clear on that, that's going to move. The other thing is track and measure, right? What you, what you pay attention to is going to grow. And if you're not paying attention, it, you're not going to understand what levers to pull or where you're failing or what's happening. So track and measure every single day and make sure you're tracking the right categories so that you can see the trend reports. And then build a business based on profit, not revenue. Oh, I love that. Because we measure revenue in real estate, right? Like that is the measure. Put people up on stage. What was your GCI? What did you do? Hey, let's talk the real deal. How much did you keep, right? Yeah, so, how much of that did you get to keep? That's the, yeah. that's the name of the game. It's the only reason we're in business. Yeah, because there's a lot of big name agents that are on some of these major national stages that when you get down to it, you're like, holy crap, man. Why not just go sell yourself by yourself? You know what I mean? Because you keep as much and have less overhead. Um, okay, I do want to ask something about so we got catch the vision, right? Like have clarity on the vision and be, start being the type of person that other individuals would want to be around. And with that, that like you go, my avatar is this person. Who do I need to be to attract that person? You and I love to fly fish. It's, hey, the fish are rising. What are we going to use? Are we going to, are we going to nymph a little bit? Cause they're just below. Are we going to use dry flies? Which one, which type is a caddis? Is it going to be for like, yeah, it's the same thing. Match the hatch, but you match the hatch. In relationship to who it is that you want to track, I love that. Absolutely, tracking and measuring, bro. Tracking and by the way, you just, for those of you that have no idea what I was just talking about, Rod and I love to fly fish, and so that was like <laughs> legitimate fly fishing conversation going on. And so, come on back to us. Right we live now. in Utah, man. If this it's part of living in the state. It's why so many people are attracted to this. If place. you don't fly fish and you don't ski or snowboard, what the hell are you doing living here? And you don't camp. So what's that? Um, tracking and measuring as a leader, right? Or owner of a brokerage, owner of a, uh, uh, you know, leader of a large team. What are the key, uh, the, the major KPIs that you would recommend if you had to reduce it down to three to five? What would be those? Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, the, the things that we track, we do an audit every single month, a productivity audit in the middle of the month. And what we're looking at are the number of inquiries that we have coming in. Um, I need to make sure that the dollars that I'm spending to drive in marketing and some of those kinds of things are producing the same result. If it starts to change, I need to be aware of that. So we're looking at our inquiries. The next thing we're going to look at is how many buyer appointments and how many seller appointments are my agents going on so that we can see is my are, are we being effective in our conversion and then we're looking at you know different lag measures like how much did we make and what was our 
expenses and you know what was our profitability and so we're just always paying attention to that and then measuring it against you know a year ago so year over year numbers and that, that gives us the trends and we can are see are we better are we worse are we the same etc okay yeah good are all of a sudden the the marketing dollars not driving in as many leads um is the market shifting from a uh, a buyer heavy market to a listing heavy market and how are we going to make sure that we're we're impacting those numbers so that's what we're looking at Brilliant. super, super simple um, okay, so here I am. I'm a coaching client of yours. And I say, Rod, I'm at $300,000. I want to go to a million. What are the key components to a plan to be able to get there? Okay. The first question I would ask is, do you want to work three times as many hours as you are now? Ooh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Most people would probably say no to that. So now we're going to explore, hey, what are the different options, right? We can look at efficiencies and figure out, hey, can we- By the way, what a, what a great question that was. Like, that oh, was thanks. just like, <laughs> oh, well, what time, right? Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead, man. So, And if, if that's not the case, we can work on efficiencies and we're going to be doing that. But if that's not the case, what is the leverage that we need to- start utilizing to be able to triple the results that we're getting as far as income, as far as revenue goes. And where do you see those, where do you see those levers are that for most people, like, uh, you know, I, again, I think the most important thing, yes, have your backend system solid, because if you attract agents that are going to start working for you and you are a cluster and it's a disaster, you're going to be exposed really quickly and they're going to leave. And you, and it doesn't take long before you get a reputation of, I can't figure this out and nobody wants to just on your team. Wow. So get your backend systems set up, make sure that you understand what needs to happen through the flow and you get things put in place, whether it's technology or people to help with all of that so that you can grow. And now it's how do I attract the right agents that are going to mesh with my leadership style that are going to mesh with our values. And, and now we can start to grow the team, we pay attention, we got to drive in additional lead sources, or we got to make sure that they have plenty of people to communicate with. But it's really a pretty simple process. Once you understand that, and you have your systems in place, your foundation just takes off. So it's number one, um, identify how large the team needs to be to be able to actually triple, right? You bet. Um, number two is lead sources. You know, do you find like to, to, to earn, because a lot of people who are listening to this right now are like, I want to go to a million or I want a million more. Right. So do you find that four lead sources is enough? Three, two, one, five, six, seven. What do you think is that, that magic number that they need to have to be able to be insulated from any type of adjustments in market or changes? To be honest, I think that. Yeah. Um, four to six is kind of that magic number. I think six is probably closer than four is, but I think that having, you know, four to six different ways to develop business is going to be important. Right. And, and it's because the market changes all the time. You can't have all your eggs in one basket. If you have um, an online lead source and all of a sudden that online lead source goes away, um, say it's a big company that you're getting all your leads from and they change the way they're doing business, you're dead in the water. And so you've got to make sure that you've got enough legs on your table to be able to support the growth that you want. The other thing is, as you attract agents, you could spend yourself to oblivion trying to drive enough online leads and so forth into the company to keep everybody busy. Um, you've got to be able to lead them and teach them how to find business with through prospecting, through circle prospecting, through working expires, working for sell by owners. It's the only way to create a profitable business. Otherwise you can drive revenue. Like a coaching client that I had several years ago um, found out that they were spending, you know, $120,000 a year on Zillow. They were being invited to all the Zillow conferences and all of that kind of stuff. But when you looked at her profit and loss statement, she was actually taking money out of her savings to support the team. She was closing a lot of transactions. She was wow. being recognized everywhere, but she was pulling money out of her savings because she was actually losing money in a real estate business. Wow. We don't want to be there. No. I remember Mike Ferry saying this one time, right? and I've talked to John Chep like about this, either we're going to do it for this. And there's a lot of people that are doing it for the recognition, the praise and the kudos, or you're going to do it to this, right? To be able to earn good money, serving people and providing amazing, uh, you know, uh, service to them. So we need six lead sources. We need to learn how to be able to actually recruit and grow, right? Um, oh, I want to go to that one, one second. And then on top of that, um, we need to know, learn how to lead them. It isn't, it isn't just give them more leads. It's help them convert, help them train, et cetera. 
Absolutely. Um, were you doing all the recruiting uh, to the that that Sugar House office, uh, that Keller Williams office? I mean, look, I had some amazing people around me, some amazing leaders that attracted good people before I ever got there and before I was ever involved. Um, but active recruiting, absolutely. And it really was setting up appointments, getting face-to-face -face kneecap to kneecap with people, and then figuring out what they wanted and what was the obstacle. So beginning a little bit of a coaching session and showing them what's possible. And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, one guy in particular, I remember this conversation, he goes, Rod, I went, I, I met with you. We had a coaching session. My business tripled over the last year because of something you told me a year ago. I can't not come over. So how does that work? What's the process, wow. right? So you gave to them the coaching and the training for free that they were not getting for what they were paying for at their existing brokerage. He didn't come over right away. He took a year, took a year. Wow. So patience is key. But here's what I'm hearing. A, you got to give, right? B, you got to be patient. Did you follow up with him consistently? Oh, all the time. Yeah. All, all the time. time. And you know, you're, you're, it's just the standard call a quarter and a couple of touches a month through social media and, and email. And it was a simple process, right? Just call know a, the system. So one call a quarter, right. And then touches throughout the month. I'm excellent, man. Biggest mistake you see people making uh, as a leader. I, I don't think they give themselves enough time to fail and enough grace to fail. Right. Um, it sounds easy to grow a team. It sounds easy to recruit a bunch of people and to create a bunch of revenue. And in the actual doing, it's very difficult. And so give yourself the time. When I um, talk to people about starting a new lead source, I say, guys, you got to give yourself 90 days to really work on this and allow yourself the opportunity to fail because it's the only way you're going to learn what's working and not working. So give yourself the grace to go through that. When you're going through those tough times, when you know, all of a sudden you maybe recruit somebody and you find out they weren't a real good values fit. And all of a sudden it's eroding the, you know, the culture in your office. Um, don't blow the whole thing up, you know, look at what you made the mistake on, figure out how to improve that next time and, and just keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah. Just keep going. Keep moving forward. That was a uh, Walt Disney's actual mantra. Right. Oh, I didn't know that. Keep That's awesome. Moving forward, right? Keep, you can see it on one of the one of the big plaques um, there in Disneyland and Disney World. Well, brother, this this is absolutely amazing. I mean, we we we're leaving this. I hope all of you recognize this. Um, if you're a leader, you got a lot of leadership conversation, but you also have some great stuff to bring back to your team in relationship to what it takes to be a successful agent that owned 20 to 25% of market share. If you're a solo agent, you just got like, here's how I get to seven figures at a high level. And oh, by the way, right? Grit, you know, is the grit, the determination, the prospecting, et cetera. Um, so Rod, anything that you want to say to all of the, the, my dog is asleep right here. Don't worry. Sorry. So, yep. They're, they got locked outside of my office. They're pissed minute. off. They're like, excuse me, yep. this is supposed to be 30 <laughs> minutes and this has gone much longer now at this point. So when does dad get out? Um, one last little bit of advice. What would you say to them as, uh, as you're sending them off here today? Um, believe in yourself, right? Give yourself credit for where you're at today and uh, believe in yourself. There are, there are people that need what you have that want to be in your tribe, that want to be a part of it, believe in yourself and, and keep going, man. Yeah, I love it. Keep moving forward. Right? All right. Well, Ron, like as a good friend, as someone that I respect, as someone that has helped me through hard times, I just want to say thank you for sharing all of your background history and knowledge to all of our entire audience that's watching this, you know, um, you know, and more than anything, Thanks, brother, for continuing hey, to move thank you. forward and grow yourself, okay? Awesome, guys. Well, hey, there we go. Another great accelerator program uh, uh, podcast in the books. Go back. This is one I'd want to watch a couple of times. As always, we'd love to be able to support you, be able to assist you. Please reach out to us at uh, Agent Academy Accelerator uh, or just go to the www.agentacademy.com website where you can find out all about what we do to be able to support great agents like yourself and have people like Rod in your back pocket. All right, my friends, thanks again. Pipes out. See you, Rod.